The Business Pulley Podcast is being brought to you by Audible with over 180,000 trial books you can choose from. Audible is your one-stop shop. Make sure you check them out. AudibleTrial.com forward slash bully. Now, it is bully time. Let's get this show started. He's been an award-winning media personality and producer. As a speaker, he's empowered over one million people from the stage. Now, one of the leading brand experts and business coaches in the U.S. is bringing his unique brand of straight talk to the world of on-demand audio. It's the Business Bully Podcast. Now, here's the business bully himself, David Anderson. Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here. So happy to be here. What's going on with you? It is the Business Bully Podcast. I am back. I am so sorry. I took a little bit of time off. I uh, suffer from a uh, condition called vertigo. And if you haven't had it, don't get it. It's horrible. And no, it's not a sexually transmitted disease. It is um, an inner ear thing where your eyes are seeing one thing, but your inner ear is telling your brain something else and it throws off your equilibrium. It's nasty business, man. Nasty business. And so I could not really function too well, you know, kind of dizzy and vomiting and all that kind of dumb stuff. And so what wound up happening was I had to go to the doctor and you know, call, get some tests run, blood drawn, all that kind of dumb stuff, pee in a cup, you know, fun stuff. And um, <laughs> needless to say, I didn't have a chance to really, you know, come in and do the show effectively because when you're that dizzy, imagine getting off a roller coaster all the time after eating a burrito. You know, you just constantly want to vomit. So I couldn't really eat. I had to spend a lot of time in bed. I'm eating dry crackers and drinking ginger ale. And if you know me, I'm not a huge ginger ale fan, unless it's Verner's. If you've never been to Michigan, get you some Verner's. It's very good stuff. Michigan, Verner's, it's excellent. You're welcome. Meanwhile, in between while, it's time for me to start talking about some people who I love very, very much, starting with my sponsors. I already talked about Audible. You know I love Audible. AudibleTrial.com forward slash bully. It's a free trial. Free trial. Get it. I guarantee you, you guys are going to get a whole bunch of Audible trials when Pitch Close Up, Sell, Repeat goes on Audible, and that's coming soon. A lot of stuff to tell you, but aside from Audible, I want to shout out Barry Amazing Travel. They are the official travel sponsor of the Business Bully Podcast. If I'm booking any travel, it's through Barry Amazing Travel, and that's Barry like blueberry, strawberry, raspberry, boysenberry, Barry amazing travel.com what i love about very amazing travel is they actually will give you an opportunity to make payments you know so that you can go on that nice trip and you're only taking a couple of dollars out of your check here and there so it's a it's a real good situation so you gotta love that yes so make sure you check them out right now tell them dave anderson sent you very amazing travel.com and of course um Oh, yeah. <laughs> For the ladies or the fellas, get you some good loving. Go over to kellyscloset.net. Yeah, buddy. Kellyscloset.net. Um, you know, you can get all kinds of good stuff there. She's got toys, whips, chains, handcuffs. If you want to get your Fifty Shades of Black on without the Marlon Wayans comedy, you can do that because they got all types of stuff. And then, of course, you know, they had that plus size lingerie, you know, for women who got, you know, hips, lips, and fingertips. The Thickums. Oh, yeah. Love me the Thickums. Anyway and anyhow, um, so yeah, shout out to all the people who sponsor the show. And yeah, more sponsors are coming. Why? Because damn it, I've sold out and I've got kids to feed and I'm not ashamed of it. Don't knock the hustle. Support my sponsors. All right, so since I've been down, you know, and it's only been like 10 days since I put up a show, um, I try not to go anymore beyond two weeks. I'd like to get them done Sundays, um, Sundays and Wednesdays if I can help it. Uh, but shit happens. And um, what really got me was what happened to Charlemagne, Angela Yee, and, and DJ Envy over there at the Breakfast Club. Y'all know I love the Breakfast Club. You know, a lot of you guys uh, listened to me on the Breakfast Club when I was there promoting the book. Well, Birdman, um, you know, Birdman the pedophile, you know, Birdman who kissed Lil Wayne in the mouth, Birdman who has all those tattoos on his head, Birdman who can't rap. Birdman, who has some very shady business practices, according to some, allegedly. Um, Birdman was upset because um, <laughs> I guess they didn't put any respect with a K on his name. And I, I'm just going to play it. I'm going to play the entire interview in case you haven't heard it, just so you can hear my color commentary with the interview. And then I'm going to talk about real business practices that have to do with this whole respect on my name thing. 
You're watching The Breakfast Club. Here it comes, y'all. Y'all ready? Yes, sir. All right, so. Get this shit all straight. Telling all three of y'all, stop playing with my name. Mm-mm. Let's go on there. Let's go. Stop playing with my fucking name. Let's go. Here, let's do it on camera. Stop playing with my name. Let's I ain't go right on there. Uh, nigga, when my name come up, respect it. Let's go. Stop playing with my fucking name. All three of y'all, stop playing with my name. I ain't gonna say it no more. All right, so I'm gonna just stop it right there. He said he ain't gonna say it no more, right? Watch how many times he keeps saying it. I'm just gonna ding every time he talk about respecting his name from this point on, okay? All right, here we go. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. He done cursed us out. Tell him, tell him, get it off your chest, Birdman. Said it already. I ain't got to talk no more. Because I, I don't understand the angle. Like, what? Like, what? Said it already. So why I come here? I did it already. I'm here. So what's happening? I mean, it's all good, but I'm, I'm saying, why, why, why? And I'm here. What's happening? I'm all good, but I'm yeah, saying, why I come that, here just Look, to I'm curse here. us what's up? What's happening, man? I wanted to see you. I wanted to talk to you on your man and your face. Absolutely. You understand me? I knew a p- few places you was at. I could have mm-hmm. pulled up, but I don't think that was gangster. I wanted to come look you in your face like a man and tell you how I feel. Okay. You understand me? Straight up like a man. So no what's the sugar, issue? No sugar. Ain't no issue. If it was an issue, you, you'll feel me. I just come to let y'all know, stop putting some respect on my name. You understand me? When y'all saying did, my name, put some respect on me. Did you, did you pull up on Ross that way or Trick Daddy? Man, I'm pulling up on you, nigga. Yeah, but I'm, I'm the radio guy. Why well, pull up on the radio is. guy? Don't act tough with the radio guy. I hate my nigga. Y'all, y'all, y'all finished or y'all done? <laughs> I ain't got no more talking. See later, nigga. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. That's just the funniest. So just all right. So Birdman is upset because I guess he doesn't feel like they put respect on his name. Mm-hmm. Um, l- let's just talk for a minute because there's a lot of people in the black business community, especially. Oh well, Birdman went up there and showed them, and and Birdman he he he's tough because he he went up there. Like, okay, l- l- let's stop the madness. Number one, baby, aka Birdman. Um, yeah, uh, bro. Okay, he's not tough. OK, see, tough people don't have to show up with like 10 people and start taking their stuff off and sitting there and then, you know, taking out their gold. All, all that was for sure. It was for show. OK, first of all, let me break this down. OK, and when I say it's for show, that's not to say that Angela Yee, Charlemagne or Envy was expecting any of that because it was not they keep the cameras rolling in case something happens beforehand. When I was up there and I walked in the studio, the cameras were rolling. So I didn't know what was going to uh you know get cut out or what was going to get aired or anything beforehand but i'm talking about birdman putting on a show putting on a spectacle okay the 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 breakfast club when it comes to the hip-hop generation is the most widely uh listened to and watched um program of its kind point blank and period right now pound for pound and so birdman knew if he went up there and he made enough of a stink that he was going to get some, uh, he was going to get some, you know, some viral traction from that. Now you got people making songs. I mean, Anthony Hamilton's uh, background singers made a song called "Put Some Respect on It." Hilarious. Birdman has a single coming out talking about "Respect My Name." All these things start to happen, you know, because Birdman went up there strategically with a plan. And I'm sorry. Here's why Birdman's not gangster. Trick Daddy. You know, if you know anything about Miami, you know Trick Daddy is that dude. Trick Daddy basically got on got on the radio and said that you know that he's a uh, Birdman is somebody's girlfriend allegedly. You know what I mean? And so if you gangster, go go say something to Trick. Go say something to Rick Ross. People feel like Rick Ross is a corrections officer. You know there are pictures and things to support that, but he didn't roll up on them. You gonna pick Charlemagne now? Charlemagne is like five six. You know, he's a small dude. Angela Yee is a tiny little girl. Envy, you know, I'm not saying Envy's a cupcake or nothing like that. He's a nice dude. You know what I'm saying? But he ain't no big brawly dude like me. When I got ran up on by, um, you know, by, by talent and by talent, use that term loosely. I mean, by 
um, you know, rappers and disgruntled people or whatever the case may be. OK, there, there may be a chance I've gotten into um, verbal altercations with folks like the Yin Yang Twins, uh, Jermaine Dupree. I've gotten into some verbal altercations with some very interesting people. Um, but what Birdman did was not gangster. That was marketing. You know, but people talking about Birdman is his own man and he makes his own money in this, that, and the third. Okay, first of all, I could have swore on this business bully show I've talked about the fact that there are no more black record companies, and that includes cash money, young money, three money, two money, whatever money you want to call it. All right, there there are no more black record companies. That's a record label. That's an imprint. Okay, they have a distribution deal through through Universal. Universal has a record company. Interscope is a record company. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying here? If somebody else is distributing you, they're the record company. They're the distributor. They're the uh, they're the ones who are out here pushing the music. So stop acting like Birdman don't uh don't answer to anybody. He does. So y'all can take that someplace else. Um the other part of that is you got to start operating like an adult at some point. How old is Birdman now? Like can somebody tell me how old Birdman is real quick? Somebody Google that for me. Birdman's age, because I'm curious to know how old uh, Birdman is. You know, um, because it's uh, it, it amazes me how um, this man got all those tattoos and so much to say. Um, and you running up on Charlemagne like, how you look, dog? You look ridiculous. Yo, you old? You forty six years old, Birdman. Birdman, you forty six? Really? Man, you just mm, all right. <sighs> all right, but there are some things that that bother me. You know, um, I'm sitting back. You know, and, and sometimes I'll look at my Facebook feed when I can. Um, Vertigo is kind of not good for blue light. You know, so when I see. Uh, Things I just look at them, and so I'm watching videos on Facebook, and it's videos of of a lot of these multi level marketing companies, you know, just talking about you know whatever you know widgets or products that they're selling. And again, I have no issues with network marketing. I have an issue with people taking credit for things that aren't theirs. There's a guy named Tony Gaskins, good friend of mine, great guy. I knew Tony Gaskins uh, before he got with Oprah, and he was trying to get. Um, his book um, on the Ricky Smiley show. And I had him on the show. He's a wonderful guy. Um, Tony Gaskins, great guy. He uh, he came up with one. If you ever see somebody using the phrase, um, build your dreams or someone will hire you to build theirs, that's Tony Gaskins. He's a young black dude. Great guy, family man, wonderful dude. But people just run around with his uh, his quotes in their mouths as if they're, on, as if they're their own. Um, a lot of people love Eric Thomas, E.T., the hip hop preacher. I would say a good 60 percent of the things that Eric Thomas has said he's gotten from Les Brown. You know, I started watching him and he would say stuff like, you know, when you uh, when you fall, try to land on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up. That's a Les Brown quote. You know, um, he has this thing. He has this book, I think, called Live Full, Die on E. Um, Les Brown has a book called Live Full, Die Empty. You know, so and I'm not knocking E.T. I'm just saying give credit where credit is due. There's nothing wrong with quoting people. Hell, Les Brown quotes people all the time. But a lot of these, you know, motivational cats, a lot of these multi-level marketing cats will start throwing out motivational quotes to people and acting like they came up with them. So to bring this around, I'm seeing people, you know, while they're pushing their multi-level marketing, you start talking about how if you look at a building, you know, when everybody's told to climb the corporate ladder, you know, they never teach you how to build a building upon which the corporate ladder leans. I'm like, yo, that one came from me. What you ain't going to do is run around here acting like you invented something. You know what I'm saying? And it's not that big of a I'd love to be quoted, but just put some respect on my name. You feel me? You know, and it's just because... When you write or when you deliver something that comes from your spirit, it's very hard to do that. You know what I mean? It's like somebody coming along and putting their name on your painting. You know, it's just not what should happen. You know, I I touched on that 
um, you know, talking about climbing the corporate ladder because it's about the education, because education is a hustle. I talked about that on The Breakfast Club. You know, um, I've talked about it in an article I wrote for All Hip Hop earlier this year. And even if you were if you were with me years ago, five years ago, I did a show. I'm actually going to put the link up on businessbullyshow.com where I talk about the college hustle and, you know, how it's set up, it, the game is set up in America for us to be put in debt. And I talk about climbing that corporate ladder and how nobody ever talks about how to build that building. But now MLM folks are running with it. Yeah, you know, do what you do. Just put some respect on my name. Um, a couple other things that I find really interesting out here in the news is uh, people being really um, upset behind stuff that makes no sense to me. All right. Um, a lot of people are upset about this whole Donald Trump um, situation. Oh, Donald Trump's the presumptive nominee now. I could have told you all that was going to happen. I told you all that was going to happen. Um, and it ain't going to change nothing. Donald Trump will not win this election. It is my personal belief that Hillary Clinton put Donald Trump up to this. And I know some of y'all think that that's crazy and far-fetched, but Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were friends for a very, very long time. All I'm saying is, I just find it very odd that Donald Trump, you know, is just here and, and, and just taking out people who have been around forever but donald trump is an excellent marketer donald trump knows how to speak to people and and get emotions popping those are things that a lot of politicians don't do well and that's why donald trump performed on the level that he did you know so it's um very very cool so Mm, 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 mm. it's uh it's crazy. There's a guy named Dana Milbank, and Dana Milbank said that he, uh, you know, if Donald Trump becomes a presumptive nominee, he's going to eat. It. He's going to eat the uh, newspaper. So people trying to decide what they're going to give it to him with uh, taco meat or whatever the case is, whatever the case may be. <laughs> yes, indeed. So you know, it is what it is. He says, "I'm so certain Trump won't win that if he do- if." Uh, if he does, literally, I will eat my words. The day Trump clinches the nomination, I will eat this page on which this column is printed in Sunday's Post. You know, uh, by March, he says that dining day might be near. He said, I'm taking a prudent step in, in preparation for eating my words just in case Trump secures the nomination. So he's looking for recipes. And so now it is what it is. So he's going to do a cook off so that he can eat his words. But yeah, man. um, Yeah. Y- y- y'all got to stop getting so upset about Donald Trump and this nonsense. It ain't going to be nothing. I, I ain't even worried. And then to-, to be truthful, the one you really should be worried about is Hillary Clinton. And I know some people are like, oh, well, you know, Hillary and she she loves the people and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I'll believe that if y'all want to. Meanwhile, in between while, um, one thing that I do think y'all can learn from Donald Trump is that Donald Trump is a billionaire and Donald Trump has a bunch of people who are poor convinced that he cares about them. Well, shit, Hillary Clinton's got a bunch of people who are poor convinced that she cares about them. So, yeah, it is what it is. Um, I'm really curious to see how everything shakes out. And no matter who is in office, you still have to do business. So what is it you're going to do in order to take your business to the next level? Those are the things that I think about. You know, what's next for me? How am I going to do this good stuff? Oh, my gosh. Right now, as I record this, um, the number one trending topic on Twitter is uh, drop out Hillary. So I find that hilarious. People want um, people want somebody other than Hillary um, to to run. And, you know, Hillary played ball so she can get this nomination. So I really don't see that happening. So, you know, it is what it is. Mm-mm-mm. Um now um I don't know if you guys heard about Prince in this whole drug thing. There's this guy and he's gonna bring Prince um some um some drugs that are kinda kinda wean him off of whatever allegedly it was he was on. It amazes me how all these people, you know, who okay, Prince didn't have a will, allegedly. Um and there was some doctor who was supposed to come see Prince and the doctor gets there and instead of treating Prince he dies. Hmm. Um, maybe, maybe, just maybe here, um, Tariq Nasheed was right. Maybe there was some kind of conspiracy to get Prince killed because the way that he died is very similar to 
Michael Jackson, in that there's an attending physician supposed to be taking care of something, and something goes just horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. So there's a lot of fuckery afoot out here in these streets. So we, um, you know, we got to be really careful to see, um, you know, what's going on out here and what we can do. Um, shout out to Janice Jackson, Janet Jackson, I should say. Um, Janet Jackson is pregnant. Yes. And um, you know who I feel sorry for? Todd Bridges. Willis. <laughs> Different strokes. Because uh, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but Todd Bridges used to play uh, this character named Willis on a show called Different Strokes. And Janet Jackson played his girlfriend. Well, he in his book talked about how he put the smash on Janet. And it's like, but you didn't get her pregnant, dog. She's 49. She went 49 and oh, that's a better record than The Undertaker. If you're a wrestling fan, you'll get that reference. Um, so there's a lot of stuff um, out here that's happening that I find um, very, very interesting. And um, I'm just surprised at how um, folks are reacting. Oh, did y'all see the? Uh, did y'all see Obama go out to uh, Flint and um, drink the tap water? Well, there were some hot people in Flint. People in Flint were like, yeah, you know, um, he's out here. He's drinking the tap water, but, you know, it's just a show. And, you know, I, I, I don't know, man. All I know is that if it were me and I was in Flint, I would have a bottled water factory. <laughs> I would be selling so much bottled water. I would have a BJ's Wholesale Club, Sam's Club. It'd be nothing but business bully water everywhere. Oh my God! Business bully water all over the place. So I'm, um, I'm just saying because <laughs> I ain't drinking that. I've been to Flint. Nah, ain't no way y'all cleaned up them pipes. And Obama said, if you've got a filter, you you can drink the water. Uh, Obama, love you, dog. But um, I ain't touching that water. Which reminds me, um, gosh, um, the uh, Larry Wilmore talked. He did the uh, correspondence dinner. And people were upset because um, he talked about, um, he said this, he said to the president, um, um, Barry, we did it, my nigga. <laughs> and I wasn't mad at it. It's the White House Correspondents Dinner. If you're not familiar with the event, um, the White House Correspondents Dinner is like a, it's like a roast of everything political up to and including the president. And he said it, and, and oh, you know, Al Sharpton got upset. I don't care if it's if it's uh, you know, um, you know, comedy or not. That word should never be used, and it should never be used toward our president. Okay, first of all, Al Sharpton, perms should not be used by you. Okay, um, so brother, I, I don't know, like, calm the hell down. I'm not a big fan of using the N word. Period. I don't think anybody should use it. But I wasn't particularly upset. I'm sorry, I just wasn't, you know. Um, so it, it kind of bugs me out when people get, like, so emotional and so, you know, like, bugged out um, because a black man says it to another black man. There's a guy I follow um, on Facebook who is a decent dude, um, but then he started talking that racist shit. And see, that sometimes white people, that's where you lose me. That's where you lose me, white people. It's a guy named Sean Whalen. And Sean Whalen has a lot of good points. You know, he's all about getting up and kicking ass. I love that stuff. But when he starts talking about, oh, well, this guy says the N-word and people go crazy. If one of us said the N-word, it would, you know, they'd be rioting in the streets. Yeah, because you can't say it. That That's why. Let me break this down. I have women in my family who can refer to each other as bitches and hoes. You know, just lovingly, oh, hey, bitch, hey, ho, what's up? That kind of stuff. If I were to talk to any woman like that, you know, um, and I'm not doing a stand-up set, if I were to talk to any woman like that and use that term that way, you know, it would not sound the same because I'm a man and there's a certain level of subjugation that women have to deal with when it comes to men, you know, that isn't necessarily fair. So it's oppressive coming out of a man's mouth referring to a woman as a bitch, so there's something oppressive about a white man referring to a black man, even um, even a, a nice white guy referring to a black man as a nigger. 
Okay, so I don't know, and, and I'm gonna tell you what it really is. It's the one thing white people aren't allowed to do, so it pisses them the hell off. But um, shout out to Larry Wilmore, I salute you, sir. It's all right, you will be okay. And yeah, if I if I was you, I'd go by Larry too, because your real name is Ellister, and that's just embarrassing. So yeah, I'd, I'd go by Larry. Yep. So um, a couple of things that I do want to do real quick. There are some folks who um. You know, always want to ask me a couple of questions. And um, this one guy says, here, Dave, help. Um, I'm, a, I'm a freshman. I'm a fresh college grad. I took a job with this uh, MLM. Um, and, you know, they offer great money and, and I can sell. And I love your book. Um, I talked to 20 people about the company and, and they're split in the middle in response with it being a scam or a pyramid scheme. And I like your opinion on the company, um, you know, it, or if, if you think it's an, a move I should be making. And I researched the company in question. Um, it's a company called Smart Circle. I had never heard of it at the time. And um, my response is, I think that there's certain things that you can do that's better for you. Um, when it comes to any type of organization, okay, you want to use that for something that's actually going to help you. And I talked about this before. If you're going to be doing any type of network marketing, make sure it's something that focuses on selling a product, not getting a whole bunch of people on your downline, because that's just sucker shit. It's an old school type of hustle. So once you do that, then, you know, then you're home free. Um, but I wish more of us would start looking at, you know, starting businesses, especially with the Internet. You know, shout out to all these young ladies out here getting these Etsy shops popping. Shout out to y'all. You know, if it were me, I mean, there's so many things y'all could do. Um, here's one thing that I don't know why more barbers don't do. Explain this to me, fellas. Like, especially black barbers. Why is it y'all don't accept credit cards? You got Square. You got uh, PayPal here. You can get a card reader for damn near next to nothing now. Why are y'all so afraid to accept credit cards? I don't get it. Is it because you want the money now? Like, damn, you still gonna get plenty of people who are going to pay cash. But imagine how much more business you get done and how much more you'd be able to do if you actually accepted credit cards. Sometimes it's not about being convenient for you. It's about being convenient for your customer. And that's one of the last places, the, the hair salon um, and, and the barbershop, where people just don't accept credit cards. It drives me up a wall. I don't like carrying cash because I'll be the type of person because I, you know, I try my best not to keep a lot of stuff in my pockets. But when I do... I do. And the one thing that'll come out is a lot of cash somewhere. So somebody's walking around here with a couple of hundred dollars <laughs> because I don't, you know, I'm not good with keeping cash in my pockets or in a billfold or something like that. It's just messy. Look, damn it. Just accept the damn credit cards. But you can go and you can literally go to barber college, learn how to cut, get your license and then, you know, be a be an on call barber. Like that's what I would do. You know, I would do something simple like that, or I'd be somebody's personal assistant. Um, I would be a line holder. Like, I mean, these are just dumb, stupid things you could do, especially now that the weather is breaking. Like, okay, Captain America comes out, you know, um, by the time this podcast is uh, uploaded and you hear it, um, Captain America will either be out or just about to come out. I stand in line, you know, for stuff like that. Or you know how people camp out for like, you know, um, theater tickets, and when I say theater tickets, I mean like uh, concert tickets, um, events and stuff like that that are, you know, huge events. I would do stuff like that. Like, there's so much that you can do. Um, you can actually invent in getting a press and, and, and start, you know, pressing up your own t-shirts. You could do that. I mean, there's always something to do. There's always something to, to hustle. You know, I have a podcast. You can start a podcast. It's not that hard to start a podcast get a website, get some sponsors, get yourself out there. There's plenty of things that you can do other than make excuses. And so I get really upset when folks aren't really doing what they need to do and um, just sitting around bitching and complaining like, I don't understand why. You know, like you could be doing so much with yourself and you don't because you want to take the easy way out. And that's just not how the world works and it just really bothers the hell out of me you know I'm, I'm just not here with it you know like it's just not something that i'm um a particular fan of oh uh, yo shout out to everybody who listened to um episode 13 of the the, the prince of the digital revolution the redham spoons mentality 
Good stuff, man. I appreciate that. And oh, by the way, shout out to everybody who's going on the iTunes and rating the show five stars. I definitely appreciate it, man. Um, a lot of big guests coming up. Neo was going to be on the show today, but he actually is on a plane to New York. So we're going to try and get him rescheduled as soon as humanly possible. But coming up on the other side of this thing, I've got a phenomenal guest for you. Comedian Rodney Perry will be here. So hold on tight. This is the Business Bully Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, we will be right back. He's one of the leading business coaches and branding experts in the U.S., generating millions of dollars for brands like Nutrisystem, The Ricky Smiley Morning Show, iHeart Media, and Les Brown. He's impacted over one million people from the stage. Now, best-selling author David Anderson releases his latest book, Pitch, Close, Upsell, Repeat, a practical guide to sales dominance. Learn how to conquer fear of selling, how to get people to buy from you, and more. This book Work will motivate and inspire you to unleash the sales beast inside of you. Pitch, close, up, sell, repeat by David Anderson is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com or wherever fine books are sold. Hey, what's up? It's Dave Anderson here, and I hope all is well with you. Now I'm going to talk to you about Audible. If you go right now to audibletrial.com forward slash bully, you can get a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download. And there's always great, great uh, titles available at Audible. Some things that I think you should uh, get. Um, great book, The Art of Selling Yourself. Um, that's a great book. Just a simple step-by-step process for success in business and in life. Um, there's another book by Laura Vandekam. It's called What Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast. Um, there's a, another great book called uh, Succeeding When You're Supposed to Fail. There are so many great books that you can get right now, and you can listen to them, and you can get Audible anywhere. You're like, but I don't have a Kindle, and I don't have this, that. Okay, first of all, Audible is an app. So if you have an Android, if you have an iPhone, it doesn't matter. Even if you've got uh, you know, one of them prepaid boost phones, you can get yourself the Audible app. Like, Do what you got to do, man, and get this thing, audibletrial.com forward slash bully. Uh, you get a free Audiobook download and a free 30-day trial. So make sure you check them out. Audibletrial.com forward slash bully. And now it's time to get back to the show. It's time for another business bully interview. Ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you I have a comedian extraordinaire on this phone right now, <laughs> I'm lying. But what I do have <laughs> is a man who is a phenomenal talent this man has been on who's got jokes you've seen him in countless movies you see him all over your television he's been on every network that could possibly have black people except for in the new roots apparently you can't have a gut and be a slave but that's all right we're gonna let this man be great if you've never seen the monique show if you have never seen this man on stage you are missing out he is an absolute treasure he's one of my dearest friends he is the funniest man i know right now and what wow. when I mean right now, I mean talking about during this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, Rodney Perry's in the building. What's up, Dave? What's happening, brother? How are you? Uh, an absolute awesome introduction. Thank you so much. So true on so many levels, except you said I have been in countless movies, and you can indeed count them. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, I, I, the thing that amazes me about you, is that in the entertainment industry, there's not many people who can have, like, you got a starting five and somebody on the bench. Yeah, man. I have uh, six children, five girls, and a boy. Uh, they range from 27 to six. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Um, have you uh, mm-hmm. thought about closing up shop? You know what? My wife shut down her end. But, um, you know, I'm always leaving my uh, my options open. You know, if this don't work out, I might end up with a little younger. And uh, she might want something that's loving, you know. So I'm just, yeah. you know, I might drop some little Perry's out there when I'm 60. I- I'm not mad. I'm not mad at all. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And so by the time they really need you, your ass will be dead. That's just what I'll be you. dead. I'll be dead. By the time they want something, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that how do you... So- that is the worst thing you can say, <laughs> to leave a kid, abandon them yeah. with death. <laughs> yeah, no, my dad died when I was 25. So, no, I, trust me, I um, I get it. 
because there's a bunch yeah. of things I wanted to ask him now. Like, like, damn, I wish my dad was here. To... Oh, you right. know, that's what happens when you have kids at 40. You selfish bastard. No, my dad was great. <laughs> but no, really, man, like, how do you maintain a marriage and how do you maintain your sanity and still, you know, find ways to write jokes, perform, hop on TV, yeah. do all the things that you do? Because you're on the road a lot. Right. I mean, that, that's a great question. They kind of feed each other, you know, um, just when we get to, you know, up hating each other, I go out and tell some jokes on the road. So I, I venture to say the reason my marriage is successful is because absence makes their hearts grow fonder. So, you know, every, every couple of weeks I go out on the road and it gives my wife a chance to miss me, give me a chance to miss her. We, we have all this great, you know, Skype, you know, sex and, and then we come home and it's, it's safe and, and, uh, I mean, all just aside, I mean, that's, that's kind of true on a lot of levels. I, if mm-hmm. I was here every day with a regular job, I think she would have killed me a long time. I'm not mad, man. I got two girls, and I want to kill them both. So I don't know how you managed with five girls. Well, you, you know what, man? You know, having girls in the house, of course, you know, is, is crazy. Um, your girls are small. They don't keep clothes on. I'm sure you noticed this already. Oh, no, no. My, 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 my youngest is a nudist. It's the 17-year-old that I'm concerned with because Dude. she needs makeup. Because She's a beautiful girl, but apparently yeah. all this makeup that she hasn't even opened or she's opened once, it's no good. As soon as she opens it, she got to yeah. go order some more. But you, she ain't got no lunch money. That's, that's, part of the, that's part of the plight, man. And uh, the beautiful thing about having girls is this. When you're old and gray, if you're remotely a good dad, they'll take care of you. You know, now my son, on the other hand, I know he can't wait to put me in the old folks on. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> this dude cannot wait to tell me all the stuff I told him. All that, uh, you got, you, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat, all that. I'm sure I'm going to hear that. <laughs> but let me, all right, let's, let's switch gears for a minute. Family aside, mm-hmm. you are a touring, active comedian. Um, how do you handle the business? Because, I mean, I know... Uh, from my time on the road, it's a lot. And sometimes you get some of this here. Hey, um, yeah, brother, l- l- let me holler at you for a second. Well, you know, yeah. it's kind of light in here. So uh, I'm going to give you like two thirds of what I said I was going to give you. Like, how do you keep the business straight? You, you know what, man? I, you know, I really made it that my business, the first part of the first half of my career, just learning a business, kind of being able to hear when a promoter was on that BS before you even leave. You know, so um, before I even leave my house, I have 50% of my money, you know, and, but that's, don't get me wrong. Let me holler that you can still happen on every level of the game. Mm. So you just, you just hope you're dealing with people of integrity. You hope you're dealing with um, uh, people that have a, a, a tradition, you know, it's, it's the fly by night dudes that don't mind hitting you that way. It's the, you know, you know, back in the, in the nineties we worked for a lot of drug dealers that would come in the gang. Right. They were strong on the gang. And so now now I'm dealing with a lot more of the 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 tried and true promoter that's really serious about making his money and uh let me holler at you is it, it are few and far, far between. But I mean it, it can always happen. But I, I've been I've been playing mostly comedy clubs and, you know, small theaters and stuff at this juncture. So I hear it a lot less now than I than I did before. Absolutely, man. But I mean, you're extremely savvy. You have your own uh, podcast yourself, man. And I mean, you do mm-hmm. good numbers. We we actually doing really good, man. I'm on hiatus right now, and it's the first time I've taken a break in maybe six or seven years. Mm. And I'm just re- revamping this show, and it's Rodney Perry live. And and what I this is this is the deal. I started doing the show because it was becoming very difficult to get on terrestrial radio and advertise where I was going to be. And so I, I created the show solely to be able to advertise what I was going to do. And it, it worked. But mm. in, the, in turn, it also uh, started making publicists hit me up for their talent. You know, so I've interviewed everybody from Kim Whitley to Kevin Hart. Uh, I've interviewed Big Daddy Kane. I've interviewed, you know, Anthony Hamilton. And so, you know, for me, it's just it's just a talk with people that I want to talk with, you know. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's the beauty of uh, your show. When I told you I was writing my uh, book, Common Sense. I had this guy Taz Daddy on my show. This yeah. dude is amazing. He's a damn jackass. But <laughs> um, when I told you I was writing a book, you know how many people laughed at me? And the comedian of all people says, you know what you're about to do, right? And I'm like, nah. He's like, man, being an author makes you an instant expert. And I was yep, like, very true. damn. You know, now I got a book that's number one in three countries. So I don't need your ass no more. <laughs> Won't he do it? Hallelujah. <laughs> Let him use it. Wow. No, man, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how you see things. And I think a lot of times, you know, comedians or anybody who's an entrepreneur, because that's basically what you are, you know, yes, people need mentors, people they can go to who can give them the, the wisdom of their experience. You know, because there are certain things that, you know, even when you and I met, tell tell these people how we met. <laughs> we met over a Twitter beef. <laughs> we were we were just bugging out on Twitter. I think we, you know, I think I, I, I'm about to call you Taz. I think David is calling me some type of coon or something on TV, and I imagine most people don't respond. But I'm so my kids say I'm lame. Hey, Dad, you're so lame. So <laughs> I, I'm so lame. I responded. And we had a real conversation, just two black men, like, yo, why you come at me like that? He's like, yo, I know you're cool, but you're a cool guy. <laughs> we, we, we've we been, like, friends ever since, man. And, ever um, since. Uh, you, and, and, and you, just, just like I may have blessed you, you have blessed me, too, with knowledge over the years, man. So uh, uh, I count you as a friend, I, you know, um, you know, I get I get the uh, pictures when the babies are coming. I love that man. So yeah, uh, it, it, it's been a, it's been a while. It's the crazy part. It's been what six or seven years. Seven years. years. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I, I will say to you, man, it, it's amazing to me. You know how many people don't have people they can look up to, and the thing of it was so that people can get the perspective. At this particular time, the Monique show was on, and it had. A lot of heat behind it. And, and when I say heat, I mean both good and bad. In mm-hmm. that people did not understand what was happening on the show. They just saw it one way. And the way that they right. saw it was, yes, baby. Yes, baby. Ha! Yeah. And, and they didn't understand that Monique was hollering not only just to holler because that's her personality, but she was drawing right. attention. And Ronnie literally sat me on the phone for two hours and broke down to me like an old head is supposed to to a young buck and say, look, look at it like this. Seinfeld didn't get to grow. It's, yo, why am I telling this? Man, tell these people what you told me. Because it was deep and it was you, profound. You, 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 know, you, you know what? It's, it's a few things. One. Um, you got a person that has been doing live performances most of their career. So that in itself makes you shoot your voice to the back of a room. Yep. And, and I, you know, when you sit a mic right under your, right under your throat, of course it's going to be loud and blaring. But the um, shows like the Monique show very seldom get to find their audience. And that's what we were doing. We were kind of finding our way. I mean, we were learning how to do late night TV right in front of y'all. So that's what that's what people saw. And we took we took the criticism. We took the wow, she too loud. We took the what is that dude doing over there? We took all of that, and and we and we learned. And and I really, by the time the show was pulled, which they never they never canceled the show. Like it was never a press release going. We're not happy with this show. We're canceling. Never. They had already renewed us for a third season, and then they pulled it. But anyway, <laughs> by the time we got to that point, mm-hmm. we were really, we were really like a well-oiled machine. You know, Monique had dialed her voice down. I was finding my way on the show. You know, my role. Like another, another season of the Monique show would have been all I needed to become a really a household name. Yep. And be, you know, but it wasn't meant to be, you know, things, everything happens the way it happens. And uh, I wouldn't trade that time for nothing. man. I did 300 episodes of hour long TV in two years. Yep. So uh, a lot of people can't say that in their career, much right. less in a couple of years. So it was a great opportunity, man. I met people like Shaka Khan. I met New Edition. I met Big Daddy Kane. You know, uh, you got to watch all these great artists. And you got to ha- 
you got to watch people get a resurgence in their career. You know, you got to watch um, Force MDs get a comeback. You got to watch um, the game get put back on television because of, of us. Mm-hmm. You got to watch um, uh, the five heartbeats get celebrated. Um, Robert Townsend and the whole cast get celebrated. Nobody mm-hmm. was talking about the fact that it was a 20-year reunion for them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So right. we, we, we were the home for that. And, and unlike like an Arsenio, who, who I think, and this is not a crit- criticism, it's just the fact, I think Arsenio has, has always a, an attempt to assimilate, to mm-hmm. fit in with the, with the white late night shows. Mm-hmm. But we were undeniably black. Yep. And, and that, that thing made it special. The fact that we were where, where black artists could come and have a seat and talk about what they had going on. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked, to, we talked to Young Money when you... Did nobody know who Nicki Minaj was? Nope. Nobody knew who Drake was. We was talking to them guys as a group. You know, uh, uh, Lil Wayne and Baby, they brought all these kids on. We was like, who are they? Right. You know, we brought them all on. They wanted to come on individually. We just like, nope. Now you couldn't say that to Drake. You'd be like, yo, we just, we just all we need is Drake. Yeah. All we need is Nicki. <laughs> you know, so it, it's a trip to watch how a couple of years changed everything. The thing that tripped me out about the show was that was was Brian White. The fact that Brian White had been in every movie. If you don't know who Brian White had is, never been interviewed. Right, never been interviewed. If you don't know who this we brother is, we actually did our first movie together. Yeah, he's been in everything. He's been in Stomp the Yard. He was the dude in yeah. Scandal that uh, you know, they had he's set a light skinned villain. He's always a light skinned villain. If you need a light skinned villain who looks like he's twelve, get Brian White. He's eight hundred thirty seven <laughs> years old. He's forty. He's forty now. Wow. Damn, that's crazy. Brian White. But that man awesome has done so much, man. and he never got he never got that opportunity. And that's one thing, you know. I'm always black, and I tell everybody, you're invited to the party, but I'm not going to not be black because right. you are you are not, and that makes you uncomfortable. You know, I'm here for my people first, and if you enjoy what I'm doing, cool. But now, you know, now that my hair is a little grayer. You know, I, I, I got children and a wife who loves me and supports me. I appreciate those things that allow us to be us, you know. Right. Um, speaking of which, because I want to I want to I want to I want to veer off just a little bit, but stay in the same lane. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about not only your relationship with Monique, but I also want to talk about the 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 Oscar controversy from your perspective, you know, and do you feel like she's been blackballed? Um, let's see. Let's start start with you know Monique and our relationship. Uh, we have a we still have an amazing relationship. We we talk. Uh, I I'm, I I accept the responsibility for turning her on the social media. She is now a social media juggernaut. She's on Periscope every day. She's got an Instagram, a Twitter. She would not touch none of this stuff a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So um, the Oscar. Um, now, I was there before we did television, we did radio. Right. So I was there the day she said, I did this movie, and it's going to change everything. Mm. I was there that day. And she told me about it. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And we were still doing radio. And they canceled the radio show. Mm-hmm. She told me, she said, Rodney, don't trip. Bigger and better things are coming. Right? Two months later, I get a call from BET. Yo, Rodney Perry, Monique wants you to roll with us. Um, we had a show. Are you willing to relocate to Atlanta? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. They say, fine, uh, we don't have any money for you to relocate, but just come. Mm. I was like, whatever, I'm coming. Right. So I get a call five minutes later. Uh, Monique's husband, Sidney Hicks, awesome guy, mm-hmm. despite what people say about him. Yo, Rod, everything okay to hit you up? Yeah, man, they hit me up, man. They hit me up. It's all good. They said they don't have no budget for me to move. What? Man, let me hit you back. Seven minutes later, hey, Rod. Is 20 grand enough for you to move your family? Yeah, I think that's enough. Mm. 
Mm. I tell this story to give you some perspective on who we're dealing with. Mm. We're dealing with probably two of the fairest people I've dealt with in comedy or in entertainment. Mm. And I've worked with everybody. I've worked with every, literally everybody that's, that's of color. Let's say that. So this is how fair Monique and Sydney is, right? So we, we, get, we get here. We're doing the show. The, uh, the show is absolutely benefiting from Monique Oscar Rock. Right. Right. Monique did the Precious movie for 50 grand as a favor to her friend, um, Lee Daniels. Uh, Lee Daniels. Now, now, mind you, Monique had already done a movie called Shadow Boxer with Lee Daniels. Right. So they had a relationship. Mm hmm. Um, so she went and did this movie, blah, blah, blah. And now the movie is hot. Okay. The movie go to Cannes, it gets picked up by Oprah. Tyler Perry, and now the the, the steamroller. Mind you, we're still on our, our show over here. It's our little show over on BET, but it's still our show. You know? Right. And ultimately, they wanted Monique to stop down her show, go to, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, they went to Sundance when they got uh, Oprah, and they wanted her to go to Cannes to France. Right. And that's when the big controversy came, because she was like, Basically, her position was, I'll go, but you guys got to pay me. And the industry was like, no, we don't pay for that. Now, probably what she could have done, she probably could have got them to pay her under the table Mm -hmm. because that happened. See, Hollywood doesn't want people to know that you can do that, you Mm. know. You know, Hollywood don't, like, like, I don't know if you remember the Kevin Hart controversy, but... You know, when when the Sony the emails got out about what they were saying about Kevin behind the scenes. But no. know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it. It's, it's a little it. dial back. Yeah, the, the emails came out and they were like, you know, how basically Kevin was, they wanted Kevin to use his social media to pump the movie. And he was like, you got to pay for that. Right? Right. But they didn't want to establish a precedent of paying for that because if I pay Kevin Hart, I got to pay Justin Bieber and everybody else has got a million bucks. Mm-hmm. So Hollywood is like that. It, it, it doesn't want to establish a precedent that way because they want to, you know, then you, you make less money. There's less money in the big coffer for you. Right. Okay. This is just my opinion. If Monique had been a guy, a male, all of this stuff we're talking about, black ball, will be a non-issue. Right. Like, we, we, that, that, that's just the way we treat women. First of all, any woman that will ever listen to this, know this, everything is harder for women. Everything is harder for women. I, and I'm a father of five girls. I, I, I don't know what they'll have to go through as adults. Everything is harder for women. So... If Monique had took the stand she took as a man, it would have been like, yo, man, he's ballsy for taking that step. Mm-hmm. But the, because she was a woman, it was like, how dare you? And any woman that stands up for herself is immediately labeled a bitch and difficult. But my experience with her is she's the least difficult person, but you're, she's no pump though. Right. And you're not going come at her crazy without her saying nothing. So I, I, I've watched her be that chick. And, um, you know, in, in my opinion, she, she was deserving of the Oscar, which she ultimately got. Uh, um, mm-hmm. is she, has she been blackballed? Maybe in their world. But I remember she was making her Oscar run, and one of the reporters asked her, Monique, what, how, is it, how does it feel to be in the mainstream now? And she said, hold on, sugar. Uh, well, I've been, you know, doing comedy for seven years. I've had television shows and this and that. So let me ask you, how does it feel to be in my stream now? Right. So to everybody out there, your, your listeners, create your own stream, man. Like, the only business we're not in is African Americans. We're not in distribution. At all. We're not responsible for getting our product to the end user. So that's changing out of Digital is allowing allow that to change. So you used to need the middleman to make your CDs and get them to the people. Yep. Now you can do it with it. You can do a movie and release it on digital download. Mm-hmm. There is no warehouse. 
There is no bunch of CDs sitting up somewhere. Right? Right. So the game is changing. Now we can I can distribute my product from, from Facebook. Mm. I can distribute my product from Instagram. I can distribute my product from my email. The game is changing. Uh oh. And now all of a sudden it's popular to be black again. Yep. Blackish is on television. You and I are having this conversation. Um, the the underground is on television. Yep. Have you seen this show? It's Love that show. show. It's so so. It's all of a sudden cool to be black again. Uh, I'm telling you, if you're an actor, a comedian, or, or, or author, whatever you are, this is your moment. Go okay. get it. It's the truth, man. I just, for me, it's one of those things where. And you know this because I've told you this. I'm never going to be fired by anybody ever again because I don't plan on working for anybody ever again. And if I do, it's because I don't feel like going to school. I'd rather I'd rather get paid to learn what I need to learn than uh, pay a school to give me another piece of parchment. They're going to make me no money. But Mm. I am so sick and tired of us feeling like we can't love us. And when I say that, I don't mean loving our skin or loving our hair. I'm talking about the uh, the stigma that comes to it. Like, all right, have you ever heard this? Well, you know, I hate it when it's them all black comedy shows. Wow. <sighs> or, yeah. you know, if he's not coming to this particular club and he's at that particular club, like if you're at Zany's, ain't nobody got a prop. You know, but if you would go to like if when the Laugh House was here in Philly, for example, if you go to the Laugh mm-hmm. House, then it's like, mm, well, you know what kind of crowd they draw. And this is black people talking about other black people and other right. black businesses. Like, agree, agree. I, I, I completely get it. <laughs> it boggles my mind, and and it's like in anything, like I have to even with this show, even though thousands of people listen to this thing every single week. And it's only 12 weeks old. That's the crazy part. The show is 12 weeks old. You know, I still have people who, when it comes to sponsorships, like, well, show me this, show me that, show me this, Mm -hmm. show me that. I'm like, yo, did you not see me beat Adam Carolla last week? What do you mean? Show me what? You know, and and I say all that to say, not not for me or for Rodney Perry, but, you know, for, for people who are listening that, it's extremely hard, but the the ill thing when you talk about how hard it is for, for for women, and I agree, it is extremely hard. The most successful, the largest growing group of business owners in this country are black women. Absolutely, and that blows my mind. And the one thing that I didn't um, hear you talk about when it came to Monique was just her process when it comes to doing things. Like, remember how you were telling me about the whole tag me in thing and, and how her mind works and, and the way that she sees things, she wants things a certain way and they have to be that way because she wants people to see certain things that they don't necessarily see um, on their own, man. Like, that in and of itself is beautiful. I mean, you know, we were touring together at that time, I think, when we were talking. So I was really watching her comedy every day and and her process as a comedian is really impressive. Like, you know, when people ask me who's the best female comedian, uh, it is hands down Monique to me because she creates in such a way, you know, and she creates without she creates without a lot of people. Like, she doesn't really have a, a bunch of people that are writing jokes for her. It's kind of her and her husband operating in their bubble, and they create like some really great comedy. So. I'm impressed with her. I mean, I personally don't create that way, but it's always interested, interesting to watch somebody who does things different from you. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, the long and the short of it is, man, she's an awesome lady. She's been nothing but great to me and my family. So, I mean, I tell cats all the time, if you're looking for something bad to say about Monique, you 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 walk up the wrong tree. And if you say the wrong thing, I might cut you away. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's, that's definitely what's up, man. I mean... Y- you're definitely in a, in a space right now where things are going your way. What is it you're looking yeah. to do next? Like, what's that next level for you? Man, you know what? Um, I've, I've kind of been bitten by the sitcom bug, so I, you, I, I'm 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 looking at doing a few things. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of work over at Bounce TV, brand new African American network. 
Um, so I, ca- I like those guys over there. But I, I want I, what I understand about Rodney Perry at this juncture in my career, you know, 45 years old, I probably need to create my next vehicle. Hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to go and do an audition and get hired probably mm-hmm. that way. Um, although I have been, you know, getting some, some love on the film side. Thing. Right. But if I far as television go, I'll probably have to create the vehicle. So uh, what's great about me at this juncture is I have all these amazing relationships. I have people that love me and want to see me win and have money. Amen. So when you get that, th- that, that's a beautiful combination. So I'm looking to put on my executive producer hat. Mm-hmm. I'm looking to create a show um, that, that really showcases, you know, my brand of funny, my brand of comedy. And with shows like Blackish and the Carmichaels, the, the, the landscape is primed for Rodney Perry to, to be out there as well. So that's one, that's one of the things. I'm writing a book. I, I'm, you know, I took a, a page out of my, my friend uh, David's handbook. I'm writing a book. It's called um, 100 Moments on My Journey. Uh, it will cover everything from my, my, my connection with Monique to, you know, Sid the Entertainer, you know, to the, to the guy that told me when I got on the stage one day to take my hand, to, uh, take all that stuff out of my pocket, uh, Tony Royster. <laughs> hmm. So yeah, I, I kind of, I'm just covering all these great moments. I mean, life is, is a, a conglomerate of all these great moments. And hmm. so that I'm working on that as well. And uh, I got a series of shorts I wrote about stand- about comedy, less about comedy and more about taking the leap of faith it takes for us to do whatever we do. Mm. And so uh, I'm going to be shooting that this summer and directing it. And uh, and uh, lastly, I do my improv workshops, man, which has really kind of become a thing of its own. And uh, it's really rewarding for me to kind of, you know, give back to a group of people over a six week period. Mm. And uh, it's it's fun, man. So uh, you know, I'm, I just, I just believe in, in work, man, and and constantly throwing it out there, and and uh, you just never know what's going to come back. I'm not mad at that. Rodney Perry is the truth. Tell everybody how they can reach you, man. Don't reach me. All right, <laughs> I don't have time for any more people. My social media is full. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Okay, everything is Rodney Perry. The website is RodneyPerry.com. Uh, most of my social media is Rodney Perry. My Instagram is Rodney Perry Live. You know how we date ourselves by saying these things? Because five years from now, it'll be something new, and we'll be on that, and we'll be like, I can't believe I was talking about Instagram. So, <laughs> anyway, Instagram, my Snapchat, I Uh-oh. own everything. My Snapchat is Rodney Perry Wins. Uh, <laughs> what else is a big deal now? Are you familiar with Blab? Yes, Blab is the truth. I don't know why we Blab don't get on Blab and just bug out one day. I'm with, I'm with you. Matter of fact, when we get off the interview, let's get on Blab. Let's blab get it on up. Blab. Let's Blab it up. Hell I love yeah. the team face. So I, I, I Blab, I do Periscope, I do it all, man. And I'm, I'm really excited about this, um, this landscape, this social media landscape and, and these apps and how you can be on people's phone. And I mean, I think really no BS tags, man, over the next, five years, people will begin to program their own stations. Like, you won't watch, you will only watch what you absolutely want to watch. And it's already here. Mm -hmm. Between Hulu, Netflix, and whoever your cable provider is, you kind of got the whole thing covered in one watch. You ain't lying. Because I only watch like three or four channels, and that's it. And I only pick the shows I want to watch. I watch my DVR. I don't know what time anything comes on. I just set my DVR and go about my life. And you know, when we grew up, you knew uh, 7 o'clock, Happy Day, 7.30, uh, Laverne and Shirley, mm-hmm. uh, 8 o'clock. You knew, you knew the whole lineup. You don't know the lineup no more. You just tell your DVR, catch this show. Whenever I get to it, I watch it. That's it. There is no more must-see TV. Everything is whenever you feel like seeing it. We appreciate you watching. <laughs> and then what do we do? Then we binge watch. We yep. binge watch. Oh we watch God. it all weekend. Binging is the yep. greatest thing in the world. And let me tell you something. It's worse than crack because I wait every year for House of Cards to drop or Orange is New Black to drop. And then I'll sit there with my wife and we'll get popcorn and we're going to say, we're going to watch all 13 hours of this shit. And we sit up there, we watch it. And then we're like, I know, right? now we got to wait a whole year. 
<laughs> yeah, it's over. You got to pace yourself. Pace yourself with the binge. Pace yourself. <laughs> Yo, man, thank you so much for being here. Hey, man, I, I can't thank you for having me on enough. I know you have a choice of who you interview, who you talk to, and uh, to your millions and millions and thousands and thousands of hundreds and hundreds of gazillions and gazillions of people. Why not? It's your boy right here. All right, man, Ronnie Perry right there. Uh listen, thank you to uh everybody for uh for listening as always. Um Neil should be coming up soon, so we're looking forward to that. Um as always, I'm going to close the uh the show with my contact info, so make sure that you uh hit me up, man. And also, before I forget, the new uh semester of iBrain University is starting in June, so you definitely want to get involved in that. iBrainUniversity.com um, so you want to definitely check that out. So I bring university.com, check that out too. All right. I will catch you guys next time. Please subscribe, rate the show and, uh, make sure that you check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the business bully, facebook.com forward slash the business bully. Make sure that you share, uh, um, check out the show folks. You can catch live videos there, all that good stuff. So, um, I look forward to seeing you guys soon and, um, You guys take care of yourself, and as always, man, put some respect on my name. Follow us on Twitter at MyInnerBrand. Thanks for listening to the Business Bully Podcast. We'll talk to you next time.